All right, so we're looking at the syllabus for Flight 102. You'll notice the quiz was due on Tuesday. That quiz 00 was that sheet you signed that you got the syllabus. For you gentlemen that weren't here before Monday, you guys can have till Friday to turn that in and have it be on time. It's a piece of paper. You may have already given it to me, Luis. At the, on the very back page here, you get your folks to sign it and you sign it. You don't, there's one on each. One's on 101 and one's on 102, but I only need one. They're identical. So that is worth a quiz score in this class. Okay, you notice the quiz on early aviation is scheduled for today and I flat out forgot to get it ready. So tomorrow we'll have the quiz. Again, the quiz is just going to be on all of the lecture. In this class, it's different than 101. In 101, we lecture and pow the next day we have a quiz. We lecture and pow the next day we have a quiz. In this class, the quizzes aren't worth as much, so I have less quizzes. So we have a quiz at the end of every chapter. So generally, when we finish a, a chapter, like today, we'll finish chapter one. So tomorrow we'll have a quiz. Oh, maybe I did it that way on purpose. No, probably not. In any case, so you need to be pay All you have to do to be ready for the quiz is come every day, take good notes, and then bring your notes every day. So if I say, here's the quiz on Chapter 1, all you got to do is pull them out and flip to the things that say Chapter 1, and then the ant questions are going to be in order out of that chapter. Does anybody have any questions about how the quizzes go? Okay. Let's turn the page, and let's go to page three. Let's go to page three. You notice it says grading policy right smack in the middle of the page. You'll notice it says the quizzes are all worth 10 points. In, in 101, they're worth 30%. The research projects are worth 30%. Your essays are worth 30%. Your class participation is 10%, and the final exam is worth 20%. So what I want to do is I want to talk about these research projects. So if you haven't been here on previous days, uh, Luis and Jordan, today I gave you four of these. And Mr. Joshua hasn't been here either. Three, four. And if you've been here on many days, no, you keep those. You keep all of them. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks. I gave him already. I like him more than you. I'm just kidding. Break. So that's part of the instructions. I know, you're laughing because you know I'm kidding. I don't really like Joshua more than Jordan. I barely met Jordan. How do I know how much I like him? Yeah. Now, if you said, if you said, see, who do I know really well? Christopher and Rodrigo, I could give you a comparison there, but that wouldn't be ethical, ethical of me as an instructor to say which student I liked. Okay. So, um, there's an instruction sheet that I think now everyone has. And on that instruction sheet, especially if you haven't been here before, let's talk about those first three for Flight 102. A person, an event, and some kind of a craft. Everybody is picking an aviation person, an aviation event, and an aviation spacecraft or an aircraft. And you're going to have to do some research, and then you're going to do an essay about it. It's mandatory for this class. The college makes me do it. Okay. You'll notice, I know I'm making you look at 17 different pieces of paper at the same time, but on the front page here, it has a due date on the front page of the syllabus. And I had everybody write it in. So if you didn't write it in, you got to go to the front page of the 102 syllabus, the very, very, very front page. And it says that the draft is due tomorrow on the 24th. Since I've got some really brand new students, we're going to delay that until uh, Monday the 28th. Now, if you've already done it, you can turn it in. But I'm officially changing the due date, this first piece of paper. And this is what's due. So if you have one, you can say, this is due now on Monday, August 28th. The one that says 102, and it's the one that's a person. Oh, wait a minute. The aircraft or spacecraft. So you gentlemen that haven't been here before, you've got to start thinking about what kind of an aircraft or spacecraft do you want to do your report on. But this piece of paper is 20% of that essay. And all you have to do is fill this out. You have to go online or you can go to a library and look at books. I don't care which. And you have to find enough stuff that you go, you know what? Let's say you pick, uh, as a craft, you pick the Apollo 11 spacecraft. It was the first machine that landed on a moon with humans in it. So you write Apollo 11 spacecraft because you don't like airplanes, you just like rockets. 
So you're going to start looking around and trying to find five things you think are going to go into your paper. And you write them down, and then you write down where you found that out. If it's a web page, you need to write as many digits of that URL, of that link in there as you can. And this is the piece of paper you're going to give me on Monday the 20th at 2.20 p.m. It's due at 2.20. Now, anybody can turn it in early. The key for you three guys is that you can't pick one that anybody else has already picked. Now, it's not your fault that you weren't here the first week, so don't feel bad. But most everybody, they've already picked all the good ones. I'm just I'm not. That's not true. Most of the good ones are still left, like the Apollo 11 spacecraft. Nobody's picked it. Nobody's picked the International Space Station. I don't think anybody picks the space shuttle. Nobody picked the, 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 the first airplane, uh, the Bell X-1, which is the first airplane to go to the speed of sound. Nobody picked the Douglas Sky Streak, which is the first airplane to go two times the speed of sound. Somebody did pick the X-15. It was the first airplane to go Mach 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. It was a really awesome machine. It broke all of those records. Um, so what you need to do tonight is look online or go to the library and look and try to find an aircraft or a spacecraft that you want to do a report on. And you can send me a text. I'll, I, will, I will bring home that material. And it's in the syllabus. Has, has my cell phone number? My cell phone number is on the very back page. On the very back page. Or you can just come in tomorrow and say, hey, Mr. Johnson, can I do mine on the Apollo 11? Or you could ask me now. Hey, Luis. What's up? You want to do which one? Apollo 11? Okay, you can do the Apollo 11 spacecraft. That's the aircraft you're going to do it on. So everybody has to turn this in on Monday at 2.20. If you get it done earlier, awesome. Does anybody have any questions about the first of these three sets of things to do? Now, what I would suggest is you copy this down somewhere else because you're giving this to me. So you might want to take a picture of it or write it down somewhere else of all the places you looked up. But, hey, that's just my suggestion. All right, so here's where we left off on yesterday. So the last thing we did was me make fun of people flying to, trying to fly across the North Atlantic in 1919 and the lack of weather forecasting ability. You're taking off out of England. You're kind of going, hmm, what's the weather? You know what? I looked it up. Anybody ever heard of telegraph, you know, dots and dashes, da 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 You've seen those westerns when it goes across the telephone wires, except it's not telephone. It's just some telegraph operator on the other end. It's dots and dashes, and they're converting it into letters. Okay. They laid the first telegraph line in the North Atlantic in the late 1850s, but it didn't last very long. But they finally laid a good one about five, six years later. So in the 1860s, you don't have to write this down, in the 1860s, we're talking right after Civil War was over, they had a good transatlantic telegraph line. So maybe they could transmit the weather in Canada to England. But what about that 2,000 miles in the middle? So it makes me wonder, were there ships with radios? In 1990, they were radios, but I don't think they could transmit very far in 1919. In any case, so we're going to finish the slide here. Here's another thing that happened with a dirigible. In 1926, somebody finally flew over the North Pole. And you can read, there's a lot of controversy about who flew over the North Pole first, because there's some question about, was so-and-so really there? Yeah, in this class, we're going to say that the Norge... That's the name of a big old honking dirigible. They flew over the North Pole in 1926, and yes, I have a picture. There it is. Is this a rigid, a semi-rigid, or a non-rigid airship? Semi-rigid, yeah, just like a semi-truck. They look almost identical. I'm just kidding. For those of you that weren't here earlier, how can you tell it's a semi-rigid dirigible? You can kind of see a keel on the bottom here. This is actually an alu the aluminum structure down here. If this deflated, the top bag up here would deflate, but this bottom part would still stay uh, rigid. And if I recall correctly, that's actually made by an Italian company. They made several kinds of dirigibles. 
All right, now we're going to talk about the most famous dirigible of all, Led Zeppelin. The Led Zeppelin Music Group was founded in the late 1960s. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, we're talking about actual flying machines, not the most famous Zeppelin anywhere. Okay, the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg was a rigid airship, and it crashed and killed, uh, I think, about half the people on board. I could, there were some people that lived. I don't remember what percentage of the people on board lived and how many died. But in 1937, it flew across the Atlantic. It had gone back and forth many times. But when it landed in Lake Hirsch, New Jersey, just before it got to the ground, it caught on fire, and, and, uh, and a lot of it caught on fire, and it killed a lot of people. I think it killed one or two people that were underneath it going to grab the lines, but most of the people that died were passengers and crew. I hate that. So here's a nice picture. And when I say nice, I'm being sarcastic. But what I want you to notice here is I see a lot of smoke right here, a lot of smoke right here, and a lot of smoke right here. What's the color of this f flame? I know it's a black and white picture. What's the color of that flame? Hey, Mr. Asman, you want to learn about the Hindenburg accident? Entity. Yeah, that's right. There's a famous radio announcer. Well, he's famous now. He was actually on a live broadcast while it was coming to land, and he kept talking during the crash, and that's one of the famous things he said was, oh, the humanity. It was a terrible, terrible accident, but I know it's hard to tell. Is, is this black or white or gray? White, okay. All right. But would you say for sure it's very bright? Okay, so it's very bright. So I want you to look at this next picture. And this is a picture of the space shuttle. They're out of service. They don't fly anymore. And if you look at this rocket right here, it's made out of solid rocket fuel with nitrates in it. And what's the color of this flame right here? Is it bright or dull or transparent? Bright. It's really bright what? Orange, white, yellow. But it's really bright. Okay. That's the, the, the material inside the solid rocket is made out of nitrates. The three engines on the space shuttle itself, they burn oxygen and hydrogen. And look at the, and these things are cooking. I mean, the flames are actually coming out of here this big, and all you can see is a bunch of clear space and a light blue flame. I mean, this, you can't tell from looking at it, but literally the flame is coming out of here like crazy. It's because when hydrogen and oxygen burn, they burn clear. Because the only thing that's left is water. The only thing that's left is water. Now, that's really hot water. It's not even steam. It's like water blowing out the tailpipe like crazy. But I want you to think about it. Hydrogen with oxygen is burning transparent or very light blue. And nitrates burn really, 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 really bright yellow. So let's go back a slide. Oops. Yeah. Yeah, except that that's not hydrogen. That's acetylene, and it burns yellow. And if you tune it just right, it burns a nice blue, but it's not transparent. If you did hydrogen and oxygen, you could turn on that torch and burn it, and you'd barely see the flame, even though it was really hot. Except I think acetylene burns hotter than hydrogen, I think. Because I think if it did, we'd be using hydrogen to weld instead of acetylene. So if you want to make a really good bomb, you strap a tank of hydrogen to a tank of acetylene and a mechanism that blows the top off at the same time, and you need some ignition source. And then you need to be far away when it goes off. Don't be close. If, you're going to, if you try this at home, do not be close when the explosive goes off. So now the question is, this flame right here, well, let me back up. You see, if you ever see a picture of these blimps, they're usually gray, and it's, not, it's also because it's black and white. But the, they covered the frame, the aluminum, the frame was made out of aluminum, but the skin on it was linen. It's kind of like cotton, but it's made from flax plants instead of from cotton plants. And then they covered it, they painted it, with. it was called aircraft dope. It's still called aircraft dope. Sorry, there's no marijuana in it. But it had nitrates in it. It was strong, and it was waterproof but it would burn. They actually put a special smoking room inside of the blimp where the passengers could smoke because they didn't want you smoking anywhere else. They had a little fan that pulled air in from the bottom and a fan that blowed air, blew out air out the bottom so none of the sparks from inside the smoking room could get to the hydrogen 
or could get to the skin, the nitrate impregnated linen skin. So the skin is, is dried up nitrates and it's gray. Inside of the bags, this, this blimp probably had five or six bags inside of the blimp. Each one is a separate bag of hydrogen. So the thing that lifted it was hydrogen. It was covered in nitrates. So when you look at this flame right here, what do you think is burning right there? Yeah, the nitrate impregnated skin. So if I take a bag, not a balloon, because a balloon, when you hit it, it disappears, right? It, it destroys itself and goes back into small pieces. But if I took, like, a shopping bag and closed it up and put in a tube, and I filled it full of hydrogen, and then I tied it off, if I poked a hole in it, and then I took a lighter, and I stuck the lighter inside of the bag and lit it, would the hydrogen catch on fire? Why wouldn't it catch on fire, Brandon? There's no oxygen in there. In fact, the flame wouldn't even light up because there's no oxygen in there. So the only way the hydrogen in these five or six bags can catch on fire is if the hydrogen gets out. So my guess is what happened first is that it was not a hydrogen bag fire, is that somehow the skin of the aircraft caught on fire. And then it, it, then it burned open the bags, and then the hydrogen started burning. But what do I know? Okay, let's talk about airships in the year 2000 and later. So if you look at airships now, they all have helium. Nobody flies hydrogen anymore. Most of the airships that are flying around are blimps. There's a few rigid ones out there. And, of course, what are most of the blimps used for in the United States? Advertising. They, yeah, they fly around on, above baseball games and football games. And then they, or some of them say Budweiser on them, and they attempt to sell adult beverages. So mostly it's entertainment and advertising. They, they are designing some blimps that will carry cargo, but none have gone into production yet. You can't go out there and say, okay, I have $10 million or a $1 million. I want to buy a blimp to haul cargo around. You can't buy one. Somebody keeps designing one and building a prototype or a miniature version, and then they never, go, they never get sold. So we're a little bit behind. I know we got to get it and go at three. So sorry, no good movies right then. Oh, what the heck? Let's watch the first one. I don't even remember what it, this one is. C G W H. The ill-fated Hinden. That's an advertisement. Yeah, there was an X. I didn't see it until it was too late. Hindenburg on her last flight sails over New York. These pictures made from a Pathé news plane less than four hours before the tragedy show the world's largest airship so heading notice, for Lakehurst, New Jersey. It's got a big over New York's famous auto skyway. The airship was hailed by thousands who operated, little dreamed kind of it was their final glimpse of the Hindenburg. Arguably Inside the in silver envelope are 16 separate gas bags, each filled with hydrogen, a highly uh, inflammable Hitler, gas. Who was the chancellor and then super deluxe chancellor. Germany effectively the dictator. He wanted the Germany to look at the rest of the world, so he made everybody... From the ground, the you can see the forward control cabin from which the ship is operated. The windows along the sides case, indicate the location of the passengers' quarters, in which many ocean. were carried to we're a flaming to death. Semester, but by this time, Approaching the Lakehurst, the Hindenburg planes, appeared a conquering giant of the sky, but she proved a puny plaything in the mighty grip of fate. Zero. It almost Zero. seemed as if fate had set the stage for the horrible tragedy. The horrible a graceful tragedy. craft okay. sailed. So they're coming in land, they throw their ropes out. <laughs> It's the only video, I know it's not that great. And I'm not showing you this because I think it's wonderful. But this is a big piece of aviation history. This is the top 100, top 200 famous things in aviation history. So if it's a bright flame, now here's the problem with the hydrogen. If the hydrogen is burning, are you going to be able to see it? No, you're not going to be able to see it. So some people lived and some people passed on. I hope they went to the good place.
Rushing to the rescue, the heroes of the tragedy dash in, okay. heedless of danger to That's help... That's enough blood and guts for one day. 